But I want to talk a bit about my business background first. Then I want to talk about the benefits of what we call responsible capitalism, because I believe not only is it great for society in general terms, and not only is it great for uh, consumers, and not only is it great for workers, I think it's got particular relevance for businesses. So if I start off, then I'm a shopkeeper at my first shop when I was 19. I'm in a ferociously competitive part of retail selling consumer electronics. Uh, and the business has stood the test of time. I was 62 uh, two weeks ago. So I've been running my uh, uh, little business, which isn't quite so little now. We have 52 stores and 200 million turnover. And we're really very profitable in really difficult times. And we've survived recessions. We've had bank foreclosures. We've had cash flow problems. We had a, an explosion which blew up our IT department. And unfortunately, our backup IT department was in the same building. So that wasn't very clever. We survived that. And we, now we've survived the onslaught of the internet, which is destroying many retailers. We've seen a lot of our biggest competitors go to the wall. I'm talking about Maplins, Comet, Best Buy, uh, those old enough will remember a company called Lasky's, and we've survived the test of time. Now, uh, I accept that I've been lucky, um, I'm blessed, uh, and I've got a fantastic team around me, but I really think also we've made some good decisions. I've learned a, a huge amount in those 40-odd years in business, and the overriding thing I've learned is that it's all about the people. And what I mean by that is we and you will observe two completely different outputs from people depending on how they treat them. And I'd like to say that about 10 times. It's probably the most important thing I'm going to say today, but actually I've got a few important things I want to say. So I will move on. I'll tell you how this came about. I started the business at 19. I was nearly bust at 21, insolvent. And I went to a mate's father to lend me some money. He told me to buzz off and said we didn't have a chance. I remember his words. He said, throw in the towel, son, you've had it. And I didn't take no for an answer. And I limped on and uh, I met a fantastic guy who gave me some accounting advice. And then I read a book when I was 23 in 1982 called in Search of Excellence by two American academics, one's called Tom Peters and the other Rob Waterman. And they analyzed the most successful companies in the States. And what they discovered, the only commonality between these widely different businesses, which is relevant today because we have a widely different group of businesses hopefully listening in, the only commonality was the way they treated uh, their customers, their staff, which was very well. And I was sort of blown away by this. It doesn't sound complicated, but it was a real eureka moment for me. And I took a, a microscope and a knife to our little business and boy, what a difference did it make? I mean, uh, up to that point, I used to joke to my friends that I wanted to be rich and unknown because I believe that, you know, uh, fame is a curse. And we would joke that I'd only achieved the latter at that point. You know, I, I was unknown, but I, I wasn't rich either. Uh, and from that moment, that was a turning point in the organization. We started seeing the profits grow. Very early on, I saw the real benefits in treating both particularly staff, but also customers well. And I, I kept my head down and carried on with that learning that valuable lesson and recommend the book to anybody. And then I met a guy called Archie Norman, who'd moved to Yorkshire to run a company called Asda. And he asked me to come and help him. I'd had a little bit of press for my business, being a bit eccentric. We used to have a Rolls Royce we gave to the store, which gave the best customer service for the month. And we had a bit of publicity for this. Anyway, he'd heard about it and asked me to come and help him. And the interesting thing was that the stuff I did in our little business uh, worked really well at Astra as well, with a completely different workforce, 70,000, mostly women sitting on, on checkouts all day, really tough job they did. They still do. A lot of the stuff worked. He had to adapt some of the things we did because I, I give a birthday card signed by me to every colleague, colleagues the name week for our employees. And uh, indeed, as they call their staff colleagues as well now after my visits. And uh, he can't sign a birthday card for 70,000 people. But a lot of the stuff he did adapt very successfully. Now, after that, I thought, actually, this is worth shouting about. There's a story here that actually by getting the best out of people is a win-win for everybody. And I wrote a book called The Richer Way, which is a bit of a, still is a bit of a cult book. The reason it's, um, 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 I was sort of blown away by the success of it really, because it sold really well in spite of having no publicity, because I wouldn't do any press signings or, or, or PR. I just kept my head down. Uh, and um, it's packed full of, of, of good ideas. The, the important thing about the book is not only that it's packed full of useful ideas for business managers, but also it demonstrates the fantastic financial returns to those businesses. So now we're, we're sticking our toe in the water of responsible capitalism. What we're saying here is that by investing in people really well and thinking about their needs, and I haven't got time to tell you the contents of the book, it's not expensive. And I, of course, I recommend you, you, you know, uh, people listening uh, buy it if they've got time to read it. But it's packed full of good ideas, but it demonstrates the payback. I will talk about some of the paybacks to um, treating people well. The first one is that our recruiting and training bills are much reduced. That's an obvious one. The second one is that our people give much better service because they're treated well. And a great example I can give you is that uh, the Witch Consumers Association members every year vote on the best retailer in the land. And we've won that five years out 
the last 10. And the other five years, we were pretty near the top. Anyway, so if I'd held a gun t- to my people's heads and they were unhappy, they obviously wouldn't want to be cheerful and positive and give great service. So a wonderful benefit there that, of course, that recognition by which has given us loads of business on the back of it. And another great example I can give you is that most businesses have what they call shrinkage or theft. And, and in retail, it's pretty big. It's between 1% and 2% of their turnover. Now, our shrinkage is infinitesimally small, uh, way under 0.1 of a percent, actually. Now, we provide holiday homes for our colleagues. We have 12 of them at the moment. Uh, More than 70% of the entire workforce use at least one holiday home per year. So it's not just a a home for the directors playing golf in Marbella. It really is a widely used benefit. The savings we have from shrinkage alone pay for the cost of the homes many times over. When I bought the first home, the bank manager said he would lend me the 40 grand I wanted for a mortgage. He said, well, you don't need to do this. And I said, that's exactly why I'm doing it. He just didn't get it. So just some real great financial, you know, this is not just, you know, lovey-dovey stuff, you know, feel good hugging. This is real. It's doing the right thing. I sleep better at night. It is the right thing to do, but there's real benefits to the business. So anyway, I wrote the book. It sold really well. It sold sort of 50,000 copies without any publicity. And then Penguin came along and wanted to sell it all around the world, which they do now, although I make less money because I get much less going through a publisher, but it's still available. So then I I went back to the biz and carried on building it. I started to get annoyed about when I would read about bad bosses, these monsters out there. And I thought, first of all, they're giving us all a bad name. And there are a lot of people working hard, trying to make an honest buck. And this reflected badly on all of us. Okay. Secondly, I thought they were wrong. I thought, actually, it would all come to a bad ending. And I've been proved right on that without mentioning any names. And thirdly, they would have a short-term cost advantage by paying their staff much less than we did. Okay. They they might make more money in the short term, which they thought was very clever. But again, as we say in Yorkshire, the truth will out. And I got annoyed about this. And I started reading about capitalism. And I'm not an academic, but I can read. And I read a few books about it. And, and something was niggling at me. I just thought, you know, capitalism is responsible for a lot of abuse and exploitation, horrendous through history and up to the present day. But, but again, it's, it's the, the system that stood the test of time that works. And it provides the goods and services we all love and need. Adam Smith said 250 years ago, he said, it's not the benevolence of the brewer, the butcher, the baker that gets them up in the morning. It's their own regard for their self-interest. So I get that. We're doing it for entrepreneurs, business people do it to make money. And that's that's fine. And they're providing a service we need. But I maintain that they have an obligation to society for the infrastructure they use on a, on a daily basis, be it the roads or the police to protect their property or the schools to teach their you know uh, staff to read and write so they can uh, eventually be fit for work and, and for hospitals that cure people when they get sick. So we all, I think business have a debt society and only on that basis uh, is it fair to expect to be accepted and tolerated. And I think that's the balance here that I'm trying to go for. The, the way I describe this is is responsible capitalism. So in other words, I think capitalism is, is, is based on greed and, and has all these negative connotations. And I think we should be, it's important that, that responsible business people would want to stand up and say, yeah, we, we agree with that. Uh, we, we're trying to make an honest, but we think it's right to treat people and customers well. And I would hope they'd want to identify with the work we're doing. Capitalism, of course, got a bad rep, bad history, but at the same time, we need it. So the only way to make it acceptable is to uh, do it responsibly. So w- what's to be done? There are three things, I think. I think the government has to do a lot more, has to be much tough on businesses. I'm not into football, but I'm fully aware that if there weren't rules on the football pitch, after 30 seconds, there'd be complete anarchy. And I think too many people are getting away with it. I haven't got time now to go into it, but there's plenty of uh, work done on the subject. There's definitely improvements need to be made to our tax system, to simplify it, to put more resource into it, and to not just pick on the good guys to get more tax out of out of us, you know, we should go after the huge tax gap in the country, et cetera, et cetera. So the government's got its work to do. I think businesses can do more. And, and the point here is not me telling them off like a school teacher. The point is, is me recommending they, they follow my experiences. You know, read in search of excellence, read the richer way or, or don't, but just try it. Okay. So I believe by being a responsible capitalist, responsible entrepreneur, responsible business will actually reap dividends. I think the public have to do their bit as well. And this is the this is where we start moving into the good business charter. So the public wants to spend their money with responsible businesses. And if you look at Christian A, they did a survey, 85% of the public said they want to spend their money with businesses who pay their tax. But the problem is they don't know who they are because the bad guys don't say, hi, don't come and shop with us. We're awful. Of course they don't. So what the public need badly is a signpost. Okay. 
They badly need this. A signpost direct uh, the public who don't know um, um, to these good businesses. And that's where we come in with a good business charter. We, we set this scheme up from the beginning with the CBI and with the TUC. So they've been involved in its development right from day one. And it's been a joy to see them working together so well. And we think we've got a tremendous product here. We think there are other schemes out there. I'll tell you why we think our scheme is so good. First of all, we think uh, it's particularly beneficial, by the way, we think for businesses. So the signpost is there to help the public. What it does is directs the public to your doors. I think it's got two other benefits as well, which I will briefly mention. First of all, it gives a pat on the back, recognition, in other words, to all of us who are trying hard, working hard to, to do the right thing. And I think that's nice to have because whenever we pick up a newspaper, they're criticizing bosses generally. So number one, recognition. Number two is that if we can move the dial on business behavior in the country across thousands of businesses, I think our society would be better. But the biggest benefit is to help the public decide where to spend their money and the businesses are going to receive uh, that cash. That's the most exciting thing for me. And I have a dream that in 10 years' time, um, you know, half the high street will be busy and they'll be the ones sporting the Good Business Charter logos. So in their windows, uh, on their vans, on their letter heads, and of course, on their website and every opportunity. So that's, you know, that's the really exciting benefit for businesses. Obviously, it's early days. We launched it in the worst time in history, 1st of February last year, just before COVID. In spite of that, we've seen tremendous interest, particularly you know, in this new year since January. It's literally tremendous across the board, small organizations with five employees, bigger organizations with 50,000. I mean, really, really exciting to see. And also we're open to charities because it's important that charities are well run. So we've had Oxfam sign up uh, and Amnesty and Trust or Trust etc. So lots of exciting, you know, it's, it has started, the train has left the station, but we want to build on that. There are other schemes out there. I'll just finish off by saying a couple of things why we think ours is better, which of course you'd expect me to say. We applaud all schemes, of course. The first reason we think ours is good, it's got real integrity because we have 10 components. We will not let organizations sign up unless they tick all 10 boxes. Now, the level of adherence varies. If you've got five employees, it's different to 50,000 in terms of the detail we go into and what we want you to sign up to. We think it's very important for the public to know that if they see a good business charter logo, that it really means something. Because other schemes have got sort of, you know, 50%, mate, and you're in, you know, we'll get you under the wire. We said, no, 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 we want to have the integrity. Number two is it's really quick to join. Some schemes take months of red tape and bureaucracy, and we're all too busy. Uh, ours is less than an hour. If you can tick those boxes, you know, you can do it in under an hour, all online. If you need any help or advice, we're there to help you. And thirdly, uh, it's really cheap because I'm funny at all. So no sign up charge. The first year is free. And after that, we're talking about less than a pound per colleague per year, per employee per year. In the immortal words of Gerald Ratton, if any of you are old enough to remember him, uh, the jeweler, that's substantially less than the price of a prawn sandwich and it will last for a whole year. So we think that has got to be a no-brainer for the benefit it will give you. I can give you an example. One small business signed up recently. They did a little press release. They had four really positive press articles. They couldn't believe the benefit they got from it. So it's not just about signing up. It is about spreading the word. This is very much a numbers game. You know, we've got hundreds of members now. I want thousands. I'm greedy. I want tens of thousands. And then the more the public are aware, and of course, we're going to be investing in social media and PR and advertising uh, to help drive those customers to your door.